Thank you very much indeed, uh, Your Excellency. Thank you. That was uh, very inspiring, but also uh, very candid as well. And uh, I think you, you made it very clear that uh, there is a long way to go, uh, and we can't take anything for granted. And it's also equally imperative that the world community doesn't get distracted, because uh, it would be very easy for the world community to pat itself on its back for the work it's done and to look elsewhere. But they need to keep a very, very close eye on what's happening. But we're now going to move into the Q&A. And uh, I'd just like to remind people that uh, this session is obviously on the record. And I'd be grateful if people asking questions could give their name and affiliation. So if we could have the first question, please. Yes, indeed. If I could take uh, a gentleman in the front row, please. And we're our roving mics. Can we have a roving mic? There's a roving mic on its way. Dear Mr. President, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, very warm welcome Thank you. to this great and prestigious institution. My name is Abdulaziz Ali Ibrahim, known as Hildivan, author and commentator of Somali politics. Mr. President, uh, repeatedly for the last two nights you were saying that you will not be re-elected after four years. Please, can you tell us one of the reasons why you are not going to be re-elected? Re and my second question is, our community has been subjected for the last 25 years, the warlords and the Islamic fundamentalists who were terrorizing civilians and through executions, torture, rape, and their purpose of killing is only to obtain positions from the government. So is there any position is left in your government to these guys? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think we'll, we'll take one more question and then we'll take them in clusters of two. So, uh, the gentleman, uh, two rows behind you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I am Mr. Ibrahim Dagana Ali. And I would like to ask you two questions. The first question is, you have carried out a study, call it in title of the missing millions, you are aware and you have worked and know very well that project is that to bring back Somali professionals and technical teams have failed through MIDA, Quest MIDA, both of them. What is your plan to bring the missing millions? We have a lot of politicians, but we need technocrats who do the job, but the politicians can't talk. So what is your plan in that regard? Second question I have. Physical security cannot alone solve the problem of Somalia. The food security and livelihood security is a critical component for Somali people to test the dividend of peace. Both of them go together. What is your plan to do to, do, to solve or to work together? The physical security or political security. At the same time, the, physical, the food security and livelihood security, which go together. The third question. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, I think we'll, have, uh, we'll let the President, His Excellency, reply to the first yes. two questions. Yes. Your, your Excellency. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Abdul Aziz uh, Hildeban. I think uh, maybe my, my communication strategy or my communication way was not perfect. I never said I will not be re-elected, but I said the trend that we have in the past during the transition was the, a president elected one time has never been re-elected. <laughs> so that was the trend, starting 2000, Abdul Qasim, then Abdullah Yusuf, then Sheikh Sharif. So most of probably what I was saying is that I'm sure that I have only this term. I'm not sure whether I will have the other one or not. But that does not mean I will seek second term. I will. <laughs> good, good. Abdul Aziz. So thank you very much. On, on the other hand, the Somali government or the political space for Somali is open for all Somalis, provided that one has to come through the channels, the, the space that has been provided uh, on the basis of the tools and the instruments in place. We cannot allow someone to come, and that is a standard, someone to come into political or, for example, someone using violence as a means to, to reach a political end. That's not acceptable. But any Somali who denounces violence, who denounces, uh, who recognizes Somalia 
is, and Somalis as a nation and as a state that exists and who respects it is all it has is most welcome. And who wants to seek the political end through a peaceful means, not through the gun in his hand? So, so people, if they, if, if they commit a crime in the past, that crime depends its magnitude. It can be someone that the society can forgive and go ahead, or it can be someone that ends up into the courts. So I'm not the one who will judge definitely that, but every Somali citizen has the right to have a political space and be part of the political process as far as he goes with the norms that have been put in place by the Somalis. Uh, Ibrahim Dagane, yes, you're right. And uh, uh, I worked on that uh, research and that document, and I'm very glad people who co-authored it with me on that document are still around. The missing millions was mainly concerned on the role of the diaspora in the reconstruction, in the recovery and the reconstruction of Somalia, and that need is still there. Me now, uh, when I came to the to the office, I started organizing or uh, planning to to establish an office uh, whereby the diaspora is engaged in the recovery and the reconstruction of Somalia. And as late as today, I was discussing with Prime Minister uh, David Cameron on how the United Kingdom government can support us, organize that office and establish the network since UK is the country that has got the largest Somali diaspora. So that idea is still there. We're working on it. We are a bit late, but we are working on it. And we, we believe that the diaspora, the Somali diaspora, is an asset for the recovery and the reconstruction of Somalia. And we will, soon you will hear the, the, the offices and, and the programs that the, government is, that the government will present to the diaspora and to the Somali people. Physical security and the food security and livelihood security. Food security and livelihood security. See, sometimes uh, different components of securities are, are sometimes some of them are the, the, hen, the, the chicken and the egg who comes first. But for us, we believe that the physical security is now the top priority of my government. Unless we have an enabling environment where one can improve or the government can improve the life, the livelihood of the ordinary citizens, uh, we cannot do it. So having a secure environment where the citizens can move around freely, they can seek their normal life. So we are focusing now security in general, but in particular, the physical security. We want uh, Somali spaces that are free from gun, that are free from the violence, that are free from people who has enjoyed impunity in the last two decades should not be still moving freely in place. So my government is now focused on security, specifically on the physical security of the people, their properties, and, and the land. Then next to that is improving the livelihoods, food security, and all these comes. Without having that, it, will be, it has been proven in the past it's not easy. Thank you, Dagane. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I think we'll take a question from uh, uh, right at the back. Yes. And then followed by the gentleman there in the third row back. Yes, indeed. The lady at the, the back. We'll give ladies first on this occasion. If you tell us who you are and. Uh... Um, hello, good afternoon, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Miriam Berg. I'm concerned worldwide. Your name? Naomi Baird. Naomi. I think the mic is probably just needs a tweak. Is that better? That's better. Na Naomi Baird. From Well Concern? Concern Worldwide. Concern Worldwide. Naomi Baird. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to ask Your Excellency what plans the government has um, to assist the IDPs in Somalia to be able to return home um, and to sus sustain themselves in the long term. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And the gentleman in the third row back. Uh, 
Okay. Hello, yeah. yeah. Um, so, Mr. President, uh, welcome to London, first of all. Uh, good to see you. Uh, secondly, uh, as you know, lately there was a, a few concerns uh, among some sections of the Somali community, particularly Somalis who hailed from the Jippas, to Jippas and Ghetto region. Uh, the concern is about some uh, perceived misunderstanding uh, on your behalf uh, regarding on your position on uh, the, the federal issues and the states who... Uh, whether the states will be able to form the, the, their uh, regional authorities. Uh, I think you're on record saying that, uh, you know, the, the Beladwin and Bai region can form their own state governments, whereas the Jubas, we will decide uh, who is going to be uh, the regional authorities. Uh, again, you've retracted that statement and you've clarified exactly what you meant. Uh, I don't doubt personally that your integrity as a president, uh, but do you claim this on your team, especially people who uh, sit on, on your communication team, for not articulating your position as a president, not being a president for one section of the community, but president for the entire country, and uh, would you claim that? Uh, secondly, what is your position for uh, people who uh, demonstrate against you in, in, in Minnesota and outside London now, you can see a few people are demonstrating against you, what is your position vis-a-vis uh, -vis to uh, jubilant issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. We've got uh, two questions yes. there, Your Excellency. Yes. Uh, Nelly, the, the issue of the IDBs or the returnees in general, we have uh, one million registered refugees in the neighboring countries of Somalia. And estimation is also indicate that there are around half a million non-registered uh, refugees in the same neighboring countries whereby either they live with the, 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 the support given by the diaspora or by doing some uh, bit of trade in those areas so that they can maintain their livelihood. And inside Somalia, we have more than half a million people who are IDBs within the country at different parts. So all together, we have around 2 million people who are not in their home at the, right now. So both the issues, the, the refugees and the IDBs are of great concern and priority to my government. I have discussed the issue of the refugees with the neighboring countries when I recently visited Djibouti, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And uh, there is a meet conference that is going to come around late last part of this year, maybe around August tentatively whereby the United Nations uh, Refugee Agency, the neighboring countries, Somali government will discuss on the modalities of how the, the best way that the refugees can go back home. So that's in process. Within five months, we, we prove it to be, we are very much involved and interested on it. Regarding the IDBs, IDBs is a phenomena that is also difficult. We have the people, there are certain circumstances that make the people IDBs. Some of them violence and conflict that took place in their home areas. Some of them by uh, natural disasters like droughts, floods, have replaced, uh, displaced them. But once they go into the centers, mainly in Mogadishu or in, in Posaso or in other places, they quite see a different life. Once they remain there for some time, it's a bit difficult to, to make them easily return. One of the reasons is that the, the place where their original homeland, there is no services and, and incentives to make them go back compared to where they are now. As their IDBs in Mogadishu or in Posaso, they are getting some sort of services, some sort of support from the international community, from the local Somalis. But it goes back home, there is no, but so there are new programs that support the IDBs to return. But the most important thing is they must get a guarantee that their home, home places are secure enough that they can stay. Mm -hmm. And then provide them sort of support, like restocking their life, giving them seeds for farm. These are the, 
but the most important, even the international community and the aid organizations are ready to provide this support of free stocking livestock or providing mm -hmm. uh, uh, seeds to, for and, and a, a handout of food for the next mm -hmm. three months. But the the most most of them they don't have the confidence that right. they can have a security in their own places. Mm -hmm. So that's why again another major factor that makes the security a top priority, physical security as a top mm -hmm. top priority area. Although the world is ready to support many Somali organizations and Somali people are ready to support these people to go back home, but they cannot go back home because at least there is a real threat in their homeland or they don't have the confidence. They don't have state institutions that guarantee their security in those places. So this is the challenge. Having physical security is very important. Having local governance structures that guarantee the safety and security of the people and their protests. So the IDB issue is complex that. Now, my government has been working on the last couple of months that we were in office to address those root causes that make people remain IDBs in the urban centers. Addressing the issue of security, coordinating international efforts and local efforts for the support of these IDBs. So we're working on that, and the, 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 the early we, we succeed on that, the, the better. So that's the case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Noor Hassan, uh, I have said a number of times, and I would like to say again, there is no one time what I said when I was in Beledwina is, is recorded. This is a modern world in the 21st century, which we are using very sophisticated technology. What I said in Beledwina is recorded. Visually and audio is recorded. It's there. I never said Beledwina and Baidabo people will make their own administrations, and for Kismayo we will make. No, I never said that, and that's not true. I would like to bring back that, 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 and I have publicly said in advance. What I said, the government of Somalia today, <coughs> there is only one and only one plan that the government is trying to implement, and that plan is for 22 years. And in the last 12 years, the, that there was a transitional government in place. The governance system or the government will never went, will never went outside Mogadishu. We may need inside Mogadishu, and sometimes small corner of in, Mo, in Mogadishu even. This is the only time that there is a comprehensive plan in place where a new governance structures will be established in the peripheries, at district level, and regional level, and federal state level. Yes, there is a political understanding that Somalia to be a federal, and the constitution mandates my government to federate the country. Specifically, the constitution says two or more regions that get together freely or independently can, can form a federal state. The constitution never said that two or more clans when, can get together to form a federal state. <laughs> now, by saying, by saying two or more regions, that makes a precondition that a region must be there. There must be an entity called it region. And another entity called it region get together, negotiate, and form a federal state. That's one issue which we don't have now in place. We have no regional administrations in place. That's one. The second thing is Somalia got its independence in 1960 and was having a f functioning state since until up until 1990, 30 years. One time, nine years civilian elected government and 21 years uh, military government, socialist government, which is both governments were highly centralized governance system. All rules, regulations, laws that has been developed in these 30 years, they serve highly centralized governance system. Never, we don't have one rule, one regulation, one procedure, whatever you call, that, is, that uh, helps or facilitates decentralized 
devolve it pa governance or federalize it. So the challenge my government is facing now is, on one hand, federating the country. On the other hand, developing the rules and the regulations for the federation. Otherwise, a hasty and, and, and immediate uh, a federation without having the legal framework in place will only cre create more conflict, more fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So this is the challenge we have in place. We don't have resource sharing. We don't have revenue sharing. We don't have many, many more things to share. What the basis of what we are going to share when we say the revenue of particular uh, market. What percentage the local government, what percentage the state, what percentage the federal. So we don't have all this. So if we do not put those tools and instruments in place, the federalism will create more problem. Instead of we selected the federalism to solve our problems. That is the challenge my government is facing now, and we are doing it. We are working it very hard. Our parliament is working very hard. It finished its first session for four months. Now, in recession, the next time when they come, they will work on those issues. And, and the government is preparing to table those, uh, 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 to those uh, uh, laws and legislations so that the Constitution clearly indicates or clearly says that the number of federal states that Somalia will have will, decide, will be decided by the parliament. Mm -hmm. The boundaries of this will be decided by the parliament. Of course, this will also go through a process. So there is a Somali proverb that says, uh, the, if you uh, hastily climb on a tree, you hastily mm. get down from mm. the tree. Mm. So we want to, go, to use processes, put in place the right tools, the right instruments, so that the steps we take, we will never relapse back into conflict or into chaos. Mm. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Mm. And uh, for regarding the Juba issue, mm -hmm. Juba is among the mother many regions of Somalia. We have only and only one policy, whether it's Juba or Bai or Bakol or Hiran or etc. All Somalia, the constitution indicates that there are 18 regions in Somalia. So all these 18 regions for us, they have equal value, particularly those who are in the South Central Somalia, where my government is now more focused on administration, on administration building. We don't have any concerns. Regarding me, I'm the president of Somalia, and I sworn in front of the Somali people that I am their president, and I will represent their interest. So all of Somalis, I'm not a president for a particular clan. I'm not a president for a particular region. I'm a president for Somalia, and I'm standing for that. Thank you. Your Excellency, th thank you very much indeed. I think that was a, a really, it was a full response, but I think it was a very, very important one because, and it links in with the IDPs, because we want these people to come back, but they need to come back into towns that are going to be well administered. Uh, they will come back if they believe there's hope for the future. And what you've just spelled out, I think building this up block by block is incredibly important. Uh, and uh, I think you explained that very well. Someone's caught my eye at the, near that revving mic at the back there. And then we'll take, uh, we'll take the gentleman who's been waiting a long time there. So the gentleman at the back with his hand yeah. up. Uh, well, if, if, if you, we'll take three together. If you go first, okay. and the gentleman in the corner. No, if you, if you go first, I, please. And we'll is that working now? Is everybody hearing me now? Good. First, I would like to congratulate that uh, Herr Bellingham taking uh, as a chair, chairing this uh, Chatham House who Somali intellectuals and other perspective, uh, including uh, in Russian community. And uh, we particularly thank you because of your depth of knowledge when you was running as uh, a Minister for Africa in FCO. And I think particularly we meet in your office more than three times. I hope and last time we met was when we, I was chairing as a Somali Diaspora UK and uh, mm -hmm. other African delegate mm -hmm. and talking about you, the possibility that the African government taking how UK government and them working together towards Africa. Mm -hmm. And I want Thank to you. say that His Excellency uh, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, that uh, I want to say one thing to international community to he and the rest of 
anybody who's in this room, Somalia are very being grateful to elected a president that will never be a part of the problem of the last two decades in Somalia, but they choose to be a president who are uh, present who are trying to be fixing the system of the Somalia. So he never be part of the problem. Okay. He will be in part of the solution of Somalia, finding in a way to fix our institutions. And I think many of us, we left in our country two decades ago. And the reason we left here, bring our children here, he was behind and look after our community, children, and he was head of UNICEF. We proud that the Somali people, they choose the right person at the right post. And we thank you, government, to lead our government. Number two, I ask, uh, the, the first number question is, I'd like to ask is that um, I think the reason I am a little bit going up and down is we as a Somali, we've been very proud to have you. But I think my question particularly is that I as a chair of Somali Diaspora UK, we have made, after you become a legitimate elected president, we have made and sit down so many community Somali in London. Half a million Somali community are living in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I have sit down with them, each one of them. And we have decided that we can get a possibility that the Somali intellectual, that they can go and contribute to back home in Somalia. So now our office have a database of 395 people, Somali intellectual, who are many of them uh, medical doctors, and nursing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 I'll ask. You. So we have 395 people who are medical doctors. Many of them, they are um, they are engineers, and they want to help to take part of constructions in our government. So can you please confirm to us that whether those who are willing to go back and take their skills to back home, whether you can provide an hospitality, I mean their accommodations, and they're willing to work with your government for three months for absolutely the best of time. So that's my question to you. Thank you very thank much. You very much thank you very much indeed. That was, uh, thank you for the work you've done on behalf of the thank Somali you. diaspora. Thank Gentleman you. in the corner in the blue tie. Assalamu uh, alaikum wa rahmatullah. Mr. President, I'll try to keep, to keep it brief. <laughs> uh, my name is Kasim Ali. I'm the founding director of WSSB, Worldwide Somali Students and Professionals, and the current serving UCL Somali Society president. After two and a half years of planning, we tried, we managed to go back last year, and I managed to lead 70 professionals to back home, eight regions of our country. We've, tra we've trained local doctors in Bosaso. We've trained uh, IT professionals in Hargeisa. We also trained agronomists in Hiran, Baladwain, and the central of the country. What is your government uh, vision for the next step? Because we have, we have a data to share with you in the future. What is your government step for supporting such an initiative? The secondly, that's a non-for-profit non, non organization. We found out during our trip that, the, that the, the greatest problem our country is facing now is lack of clean water. And as a geologist and air scientist, we realized that we need to provide a clean water for our country for the next 10 to 20 years. And that can only be done by government, not only government, but also companies. What will your government to do to set up or facilitate setting up water and resource companies? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Dean. So two Thank questions you. on the diaspora and also on clean water. And I Thank promise you. the gentleman there, again in a blue tie, on the end there. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mohammed Ahmed Antobo, a director of Active for Somali. We're based in Bristol, United Kingdom. Mr. President, your government is in a inflation state formation process and there's a huge external and internal expectations. What are your key performance indicators and what is your advice for those who want quick outcome? Thank you very much, Sheed, and uh, an absolutely exemplary short question. Thank you very much. Your Excellency. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to one point that I know Hassan's question, last one, which I missed to say about about the people demonstrating outside. Uh, and the same as he rightly said was true when I was in Minnesota. I'm, I'm very pleased, really. Because in the past, when we differ, one used to go and get back and hold on his AK-47 and start shooting. <laughs> now, if one going to get a board and say, no, I disagree with you, mm -hmm. I think that's the most, most welcome. And, and, and I do appreciate it. We have differences. There's no point. 
I'm not an angel. I'm not, I'm not claiming that I'm always right or my government is always right. So these people, they have all the right to express their views, what they see, provided that they are not misled, they are misguided, or they are not be able to provide. And I'm willing and be more than happy if I can sit with them, talk to them, explain to them, the, do my best to explain to them their concerns and the way I see it. I'm sure many of them we never met before. So uh, if I get this opportunity to do that, I will do that. So that's that. Coming back to uh, my brother, who I missed his name, Muhammad Elmi. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Muhammad, for the kind words uh, you, 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 you said to me. Thank you very much. For the nine, 395 technocrats that are ready to do, the government has planned a process whereby we want the state building uh, project to be a project that is owned and participated by all Somalis. So we're taking closely. Soon, next month, let me go back. We, we established priority areas. Uh, there is a document to call it the beginning of new foundations based on six pillar policy that has been published by my government. On on that priority, six pillar areas, if there is a priority of the priorities with three areas, security, judiciary reform, public finance management reform. Now, next month, the Minister of Justice has planned a conference in Mogadishu whereby 150 people, Somalis mostly, from the diaspora and from inside Somalia will be meeting and discussing on the review of the judiciary system of Somalia. The government will present the proposed review of the judiciary system to those uh, 150 Somali experts, legal experts, religious scholars, traditional elders, sociologists and economists, and different groups. So that will be the beginning of the first reform in the, in the judiciary system. So, the, uh, this, will, this is not the only one incident, but there are set of such uh, a deliberation that will take place in Mogadishu. The government of Somalia is not rich, uh, we have no money. One of the things that we wanted to engage the diaspora is for, for financial, to support mm -hmm. fina financially to government programs and projects. So what we can offer is we can accommodate that number of people for a few days that they are meeting, for five days, one week of a conference, yes, we can accommodate, we can afford that. But for a complete engagement, someone who wants to contribute and remain in Somalia for a couple of years, today the government cannot afford. Maybe tomorrow we can. And for the, someone before asked me about the MIDA, Quest MIDA, that's very good project. They are bringing back people to Somalia to work. But it has one inherent problem. That is someone who has been taken from London and take to Beledwain or Posaso or Galkayo or Kismayo, wherever, and given a contract of one year and is being paid by certain amount of money. When that one year ends, no more money for that expert, and the Somali government either cannot afford to pay that amount of money, or they do, the Somali government does not control the area where he is working. So the guy has no other option other than to come back to London and then stay here and, uh, until he gets. So that off and on process was the problem that the Quest Media projects mainly were having. So this is a time we are talking about people to voluntarily come back, try to establish their own way of life in Somalia. And the government will, we are offering salaries to the government employees or the government staff, but that salaries will never help someone who got a mortgage in Minnesota or a, <laughs> a, a bank loan here in London. That will not help. So this is the, the, the challenges we are having now, but this is most welcome. As of now, Mogadishu, if any one of you has been, have been there in Mogadishu, the, the place is completely changing. It's, it's not changing, it's transforming. 
uh, new hotels emerged, new restaurants, new supermarkets in Mogadishu, all of them, new buildings. Many of these small businesses have been invested by diaspora people. Mm. So the, 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 the role of diaspora is already there, but still we need more, mm -hmm. we need to engage them more. The issue of lack of clean water in Somalia, this is a very famous uh, challenge, it's there. But the question is, we never said, and no one has ever said that there is no need for uh, clean water. All that we have, the problem with Somalia, if we just try to list them, the list becomes endless. It will continue. It's, it's long. What is the essence of doing things is how can, how can we prioritize those issues, which are the most important. For example, if someone donates a well in Somalia, water well somewhere, if you cannot go there and dig that well, so what is the point of, of, of donating that well? We need to create a conducive environment where clean water can be provided by the government. As of now, we have planned and it's already in place. We already have a, a, a funds for that uh, a beginning funds for five small projects for districts. One water well, one is elementary school, one health post, call it MCH or clinic or OBD, whatever it is, a police station and a district administration building. We need each and every district to have that small five projects. That indicates that clean water is, a, is among the top priority area since it's one of it. So definitely, that's the position of the, of the government, and we do agree. Regarding the key performance indicator of Mohammed Ahmed, thank you, Mohammed. The beginning of transparency, the beginning of accountability, there must be a benchmarks to mission, whether you are transparent, whether you are accountable, whether you are performing, there, there must be yardstick. My government's yardstick is there in place. It's, and one of it is what I was just right now saying, that that five small projects for each district is a measurable performance indicator. And we have also the same in terms of security when we said the number of security forces we want to have, the number of security institutions that we have the number of security legislations that the government wanted to table in the parliament. So we have that set of uh, performance indicators whereby one can claim, yes, we can say there are force majeure, we can delay, we can do that, but this is the first time that a Somali government have a plan in place that one can account for, one can make sure whether the government is delivering or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. What we're going to do, we're going to have, uh, I think, at least two lots of free questions. We might even get a, a, a third lot if you, if, please keep it brief. Uh, the, the lady in the third row back, and then I'm going to take, uh, well, we'll see how we get on. We'll take someone, we'll take the gentleman on the far left there, but, but you can tell us who you are, the lady there. Yes. Um, Sally Healy, uh, formerly with Chatham House and now with Riff Valley. Um, Mr. President, I wanted to ask you a question about international issues. Um, in, in London uh, these days, everybody's talking about the similarity of uh, Somalia and Mali. Um, and uh, there's a similarity in their names, which I hadn't even noticed before. Um, I, I'm wondering what, uh, what you think about this comparison between um, Somalia and Mali, and in and the, the 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 kind of the serious question analytically is whether you think it is the local politics, the local drivers, the those kinds of issues that actually drive people to violence and extremism, or whether it's the international networks that have to be regarded as the major problem. Thank you very much indeed. I have a gentleman number far left. Huh? <laughs> Mr. President, oh, Mr. President, 
It's very interesting, actually, in Somalia. The most important is security. We actually support your political envision by parties, terrorists, and warlords. There is a contradiction. In central East of Somalia, last week, 21 of last month, your interior minister have announced the warlord should be led in Galmudu. So, how can I mean, warlord is leading Galmudu as a president, illegal president? So, how can you repair that problem? Thank you. And the, the, the lady uh, three rows behind you in the scarf. Hello. Um, my name is Amina Daoud, and I have a few questions. Not um, too many. Can we give it maybe two? Yes. <laughs> One of them is, why are you looking for more arms? Because Somalia has, for the last 22 years, there have been a civil war, and people were killing each other. Why are you looking for more arms? Why aren't you collecting the arms that's, that is already there? That's one question. The second one is about the woman who is in jail, who was raped, and, and who was an IDP, and the journalist that reported was also jailed, and she was jailed because she, she said she was raped by one of the soldiers. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So we, uh, we got those three questions, then we'll do another section. Uh, Another group of three. Your Excellency, we'll, we'll, we'll do those first, those three questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Sally Healy, uh, the, we all know that the issue of extremism, it has its own uh, background and way of existence. These organizations or this phenomena of extremism is underground, it's run by underground organizations. So that's what makes the phenomena sometimes difficult to understand or difficult to, to deal with. So there are proven uh, links that there was a link between Al-Shabaab in Somalia at the corner of the continent in the Hone and the Boko Haram in the other corner of the, of the continent uh, in, in, in Nigeria. So I have no information that indicates that Al-Shabaab and those in Mali has a relationship, but I can imagine. This network, the, these networks are very fluid, very uh, underground, and very mobile, moving here and there. The issue of uh, internationalization or localization of extremism, I think two phenomena when they join together, that's what makes this extremist group is more visible and more active. That is the, the grievances of the local people and the ideology of a core international group when they met somewhere. That's what makes this force exist and operate. Of course, in Somalia, we have more than two decades of conflict whereby the, the law of the jungle have been applicable to the, 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 the one who's more stronger will always subject to them. So there are a lot of grievances, economic grievances, clan grievances, other social grievances that make us attractive to the evil forces of extremism, the piracy, and all this. I go back to, to Somalia case, for example, 25% of school-age children goes to school in Somalia, as, as today and as of, of the past. 75% of the school-age children, they play in the ground. Now, imagine a boy who was five years old when the Somali state collapsed in 1990. Today, he's 27. Most probably, he got kids. And he cannot afford to buy some food for his kids. He has no the tool for the life, the tool for the life in, the, in, his, in his hands. He's not a skilled. If you get a chance even to work, you don't know what, he has no skills to work for. He don't know where to go. He remains in the village where he has been for the past 27 years or so. So that guy is easily vulnerable to be recruited by Al-Shabaab. So, 
the 20, 75 percent of school age children which didn't get opportunity to go to school. What we are seeing is the beginning of that time it bomb. And that's the forces in Shabab, the forces in, in, in the pirates. Shabab, we know uh, the, the, the root causes that. So th these are the people who, and those who have been subjected to bigger forces, bigger clans, bigger groups who were so frustrated and who need sometimes compelled to have that sense or that sense of taking revenge over the perpetrators. So this extremist group, is, this is an element whereby they recruit people, looking after that social grievances. When the ideology come, this extremism ideology come into Somalia, the first things they look was this vulnerable, this uh, grievances, social grievances that exist, and they recruit. So the mix, the, so, the local grievances, social grievances of the local people, and, and export imported extremist uh, ideology from somewhere when they marry each other. That's the one we have, Shabab, Boko Haram, whatever uh, that's come. So that's the case. It's not purely international. It's not purely local. That's what drives the, the, the forces that work for the extremism. Uh, I lost the, the name of the brother from, mm -hmm. from there, mm -hmm. Hassan. Good, Hassan. Hassan, uh, the case of, in, in the, in the post-conflict environment, we do not agree the history. The hero of someone is the warlord of another. <laughs> we have no world warlords whereby the international has branded them as the warlords. But still, some constituencies, they are the heroes who defended their people, mm -hmm. the heroes who defended the prestige of the clan, and so on. So having someone to give that name sometimes is not, is not an easy matter. Mm -hmm. The process of uh, extending the governance system all over Somalia has nothing to do with, the, with, with, with what is existing in the ground. If the definition of warlord is someone that has got a militia, then we have a countless number of warlords in Somalia. And my government, we have no choice but to deal with them. We don't want to address everything with the barrel of the gun, use the gun violence against violence. What we are trying is that those who claim that they represent someone, some community, some clans, we need, the, our first approach is to address and, 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 and open a dialogue with them if that is attractive to them. If that does not work, then time will tell us when we use a violence against them. So Amina, I said, why are you looking for more arms, more weapons? Amina, we are not, look, we are not looking for more weapons and more arms. Yes, Somalia, there is a lot of weapons in Somalia and in the hands of... Some researchers indicate that there is an average of five guns in every Somali household. Sorry, sorry, three guns. Three guns in every Somali household. That means maybe some of the homes we have ten guns. Some of them, we, some of the house, we don't have guns at all. But when you make it a sort of average, that's what some people suggest is. We have plenty of them, but we have the experience in Somalia. Every group who organize themselves, whatever name they use, religious name, clan name, any other name, and who says that we make security on the outside the framework of a state, it never delivered that security. It only added more problem to the problem that was existing. The case of the warlords, the case of the Islamic courts, the case of any other group that got the gun. So this is a time we're talking about a state, the legitimate coercion of a legitimate state. What we want is that 
an, 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 a weapon that is controlled by certain rules and regulations. I don't think that we have a scarcity of weapons here in London. But the whole issue depends on the hands that are holding that, that, that weapon. And this is a time we are thinking that very legitimate, very responsible hands should, should keep the, the weapons with us. And we are looking security forces, professional, disciplined, clear command and control, so manage it and supervise it by civilian authorities. This is what we are looking. We are not looking malicious. We are not looking to establish uh, guns with uh, unknown people. The women case. Many of the friends sitting in front of me, they know me personally. And I have a very clear track record of the past. I'm close to, I'm more than 55 years old. So I have a record at least of 30, 35 years what I was doing in my life, in my life in Mogadishu, and particularly in the last 22 years. So I, I'm hoping that my sister Amina is not doubting that I am someone who is in favor of violence whatsoever and in with whatever manner it comes, let alone the, the, the violence against women. And my position of human rights and women are very clear. But the question is here. There is a case in the court, and what we all have been advocating for long years was the rule of law to flourish in Somalia. What we have been advocating, what I've been advocating when I was an active civil society member was an independent judiciary system, independent from the politicians and the interference of the politicians. Today, when the case was raised, particularly this unique case. You know Somalia, at this situation, we have a, lo a long list of cases bending for the court, waiting courts. The capacity of our courts, the investigative capacity of our police forces, all we can understand. So there is a long list of cases that are waiting to go into the court. For this one, when the, re the case was raised, all I did was, to ask, this case has to be, it has to be moved fast into the court. And within reasonable time, the police take the file, put it into the court. What I know is that three times, the United Nations had hired two lawyers for the victims. What I know is that three times, these lawyers, they requested the postponement of the court just to build their case, which is very, very legitimate an, an, an argument, legal and legitimate argument. So the case is in the court. We are waiting the results. If we are satisfied with the results, we are okay. If we are not satisfied with the results, then there is another legal instrument that we can use again. So the minimum thing that I can do is just wait and have a, a trust on the judiciary system. I am not in a position to interfere a case bending in the court. What David Cameron can do, a case in a court here in London, or Her Majesty, what she can do. I don't want to, to improve or to facilitate that culture of politicians mm -hmm. interfering with yes. the judicial system. Mm -hmm. Even if our judicial system is weak or, ha or have some weaknesses, we wait and we let us have mm -hmm. little patience and mm -hmm. soon we will have mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, th thank you very much to you, Your Excellency. I'm gonna use my chairman's prerogative and have uh, uh, four final questions because we are overrunning. Uh, and have, I know some people have been incredibly patient, but there was someone who did catch my eye a, a <coughs> moment ago, but the gentleman there near the door I'm going to take the lady in the fifth row back. Yes. Gentleman there? Yes. And if we have short, sharp questions, I'd be very grateful because His Excellency has been incredibly patient. Um, I'll make it quick. Um, I was watching the program on Universal TV yesterday night, and it was the first time I had the 4.5 system. It's I think not... Mike, check the mic. It's on, isn't it? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was watching yesterday's program on Universal TV when you said the 4.5 system is not part of the constitution, and that was the good news. But I have a question, and, and I congratulate you, the new cabinet ministers, where you've looked at five main different tribes in Somalia. But what about the parliament? Why is it still 4.5? Thank you very much, Deed. The, 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 the lady who is in the fifth row back. Thank you very much. My name is Agnes. I work for London Africa Media Network. My question is, what is your government doing to strengthen uh, relations with the neighboring countries, particularly Kenya? Yeah, strengthening relations with Kenya. Neighboring, uh, countries. neighboring countries, yes, indeed. Uh, and the, 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 the gentleman in the row, well, second row back, and then the next one is the gentleman behind him. Yes. Yes. <coughs> Mohammed Abdurrahman Haji, uh, Somali Fed Forum. Uh, I, I would first of all uh, would like to congratulate you, Your Excellency, for being elected as a president. Thank you. Uh, my question is, as we know, uh, the education system that's flourishing now in Mogadishu and other parts of Somalia is paid is paid uh, by uh, by the students. Uh, is it possible, and is there a plan? that you have, which will provide freely uh, the education, the 75% that you have just, just mentioned, uh, are expecting, especially in low-income groups. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aidan. The gentleman immediately behind. My name is Aidan Hartley. I've been a journalist covering Somalia since 1991. Um, I wanted to ask what the role of foreign private investment is in the reconstruction of Somalia. Is it too early for FDI to take place at this stage? Is it a process that you want to be led by the diaspora? Um, uh, I recognize this in a recent film I did about Ahmed Jama, who runs the village restaurant in Mogadishu, the master chef of Mogadishu. Uh, an extraordinary story of uh, of entrepreneurial spirit mm, that has sustained agree. the Somali people over the last 20 years of uh, conflagration and anarchy. Um, is it something that you need to bolster the finances of your government that you say uh, lacks cash? And surely, when people recognize the, um, the next big thing in the world is uh, Africa's economic rise, that uh, you should be looking at private investment rather than aid, which has been, in so many cases, damaging to Somalia's history. Thank you very much, Deed. And if anyone hasn't seen the, the film, the, the MasterChef of Mogadishu, I do recommend it. I'm going to have one final question for a lady who caught my eye ages ago, and I've been trying to bring her in. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, Excellency. My name is Ilham Gassar from the Council of Somali Organisations. My question to you is, there's... Um, a brain drain in Somalia right now, and there's a lot of resources, talent resources in this country. There's so many organizations, Somali-led organizations, who have been doing a lot in the past 20 years to help aid and, and put assistance in Somalia. What is your government doing in terms of making links with organizations that exist here and using their resources to rebuild your country, particularly state schools and infrastructure, and educational infrastructure for young girls? <coughs> We'll have those five and then we'll call it a day. Yeah, so sorry. Your yeah. Excellency. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Muhammad Abdurrahman, uh, I couldn't recognize you unless you mentioned your name. By the way, Muhammad Abdurrahman, I know since 1970, but now he's a different person. Muhammad, you, you, become, you look too old than you are. <laughs> thank you. It's nice to, meet, nice to see you, Muhammad, again. Thank you. Uh, yes, people like me and Muhammad and, and people who are our age is the people who have enjoyed the most the benefit of, a, of, the, benefit of the Somali state. Uh, the only investment my family put into me was to give me three meals a day, a uniform, and a notebook not a textbook, but a notebook. The rest was provided to me by the government. And when I finished the secondary and go into the university, uh, I was even paid. The government, at the end of the month, I was, I was given money so that I can buy 
whatever. That's how we finished our, our university. And uh, I hardly doubt whether in the near future that a Somali government will be in place that can afford that much of support. And then that was added to employment guarantee. If one finished secondary, if he wants to work, employment is ready. If you want to continue university, when you finish the university, you are the next day you are employed. So that good days we have in the past, uh, and hardly doubt that it will be there soon, but it's possible still. The issue of education, uh, I just want to bring you the picture on the level of education in Somalia and the role of the government right now and what we want in the, in the future. Today, we are in Somalia where there is a school. Um, um, I said 25% of the school children are going to schools. Those 25% are those mostly those who can afford to pay $10 at the end of the month. $10 fee, most of them, not all of them, most of them. Uh, there are hundreds of schools, more than 100 schools, for example, in Mogadishu. None of these schools is controlled by the government. We use it to have a Minister of Education that have uh, close to 400,000 students and close to 60,000 supporting staff for those students that run by the almost half a million people was what the Minister of Education was running in Somalia. Today we have a Minister of Education that has no one school and that has no control over one school. So there is, there, that's where we are today. And the, for the first time, the five small projects which I mentioned it now, and I said one of these five projects is a school. That's the beginning when a state-run school, will, public school, will be emerging. That is the, the, the re-emerging of public schools in Somalia. We want to go back to where we come from, free education, free education at all levels, but we don't know when, when we will reach that. But my government is committed to reconstitute that a system of public schooling in Somalia with that level. If we succeed within 2013, we want to see, to see a minimum of 50 schools, public schools in place where there is no one now. The same is the health and it is there. So we're trying and we will do our best in order to. Mr. Hartley, he said, the foreign investment is a priority area. And when our parliament get back to this business in March, early March, one of those bills that the government is going to table is the investment law of Somalia. We want to put in place the investment law that protects the right of the investors and gives guarantee that this is their, their, their right. If, so that, in, that in, what makes us do that is we believe that the reconstruction of the country will mainly be done by the private people. As of now in Mogadishu, a week ago when I was leaving, there are two major projects that already have started. One is the real estate project whereby 500 houses will be built in Mogadishu by private companies, Somali co private companies. And this is an area where Somali business people are good. We have seen the real estate in Nairobi, in Juba, in Dubai, and the role of the Somali, Somali business community has did that. So they, we allocated a piece of land where 500 houses will be built soon. And they told me, those, the, the owners of that company, that many of these houses are already sold by the diaspora, to the diaspora. So that's one. The other is the uh, power plant in Mogadishu, whereby a Somali company is constructing a 50 megawatt power system, costing one, 70 to 100 million dollars. Where today, the power 
the price of the power in Mogadishu is $1.2 per kilowatt, one of the most expensive energy in the world, $1.2 per kilowatt. These guys, their business plan indicates that it will, they will bring down to 0.28 per kilowatt. So see the difference. If that is realized, industrialization and everything is possible at least in Mogadishu. They promise it that within six months, half of Mogadishu will, will have that power, and with, within 11 months, through all of Mogadishu will have that power. This is purely 100% Somali company invested by Somalis. Many of them, many of these resources comes from, from, the, from the diaspora. So we, we very much focus it on giving space for the private, for the reconstruction of the country, public-private partnership wherever possible, we, will, we, we prefer, because we have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of facility that the previous governments were having. Prime land, prime uh, 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 properties in very important areas, infrastructure, we're looking all to, 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 to give a bigger space the, the private sector, including outsourcing many of the government services, whether it's the airport facility, facility port facility, uh, free zone establishment of free zone area in, Mog in Mogadishu and in many parts of Somalia in the future. So we are relying on the private for the reconstruction of the country, and we see it as an opportunity having a very dynamic and vibrant uh, diaspora uh, the example that you have taken, Ahmad, is, is, is absolutely a very good one. But there are a number of Ahmads in Mogadishu today. Thank you. <laughs> well, Your Excellency, once again, a very, very big thank you. And I do apologize, but I couldn't call a lot of people who wanted to ask questions. Thank you for your questions. They were very full. They were excellent questions, and you gave many candid, very honest answers, uh, Your Excellency. I've always been a glass-half-full person, <laughs> and when I came to, to look at the Somalia brief, I, I, I spent time being pessimistic, but all I can say is I'm more optimistic now than I've ever been before. I think you've got so many uh, God-given advantages over other countries. You've got a thriving diaspora, you've got the most extraordinary natural resources. Yes. And you've got something else. You've got determination among your people to make a success for the future. And I think that does stand you in very good stead. Thank you again, Your Thank Excellency. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.